Okay, hello everyone, and thanks for joining me here on this, uh, this which is my first YouTube drawing video, and, and for sure not my last, but uh, really, really nice of you to join me, and, and really, really cool. You're watching my first attempt at, uh, at doing a drawing video on YouTube. Uh, actually, that's a lie. It's not my first attempt. It's my second attempt, but my first attempt will never make it to YouTube because not really having understood how to set the camera up, I took 30 minutes of video of the back of my head um, and I produced this uh, and really, you know, did a lot of explanation about how I managed to get that far into the drawing, but yeah, I was just uh, watching the back of my head. So, I decided to start the drawing from scratch. Um, and what I've done is, uh, I think for the sake of what I wanted to accomplish with this video, I just did the line work already for the drawing, uh, because what I wanted to focus on this time here for my first video was things that I've learned about using uh, graphite to work with Bristol paper. This is a very, uh, very thick paper, very, very smooth paper. It's great for working with graphite, for sure, but um, it requires uh, very special care. And that's something that I learned after having used graphite on a much grainier paper for a long time. And then I switched to Bristol recently, and yeah, the first few attempts weren't very inspiring, and then it slowly got better as I learned how to work with the new paper. Um, I guess before I start, I'll tell you a little bit about who you're watching. Uh, I just actually started to draw very recently. This is February of 2016. I started drawing in July of 2015. Yeah, prior to that, I never drew at all. In fact, I used to tell people that uh, that drawing was something that was totally beyond me and something I, I couldn't understand how people could do. And then uh, in the summer of 2015, I, I decided I wanted to try. And my first few attempts were awful. They were they were really just terrible, but uh, but as uh, as I kept learning and and uh, watching YouTube tutorials, you know I started to learn I started to learn what I was doing wrong and how to improve things. And you know you just have to put in the time and, and the effort and really the dedication, and you really 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 can improve. And so I thought you know I learned so much by watching, just by watching YouTube tutorials, guys like Alfonso Dunn, who's just unbelievably good, his tutorials are fantastic, or, uh, or Stan Prokopenko, all, just a ridiculously good artist and a, and a great teacher. Um, another guy I like to watch is, uh, his name is uh, Brad Jones, or Bradwin Jones, or is it Bradwin Taylor? Well, wow, that's uh, not cool. Can't remember his last name. Uh, anyway, he, um, he's actually, he considers himself a student, uh, but the stuff he does is just great. You know, he draws and he narrates while he's drawing. He talks about what he's thinking and what he's going through. And uh, it's really, really nice to watch him work. He's, uh, he's extremely skilled at what he does. So I thought, you know, I've learned quite a bit from these guys from YouTube. Bradwin Jones. I just looked it up while I was talking. Yeah, not Taylor. I don't know what I was thinking about. Uh, and um, you should check those guys out for sure. Uh, another guy I watch a lot of is uh, his name is Sykra Yasin. He's he does these really long videos where he talks about the the nature of drawing and how you learn and, and how how artists think and, and what's involved in that. Also, very very interesting stuff. So I thought, you know what? I've learned. Uh, in a short time, I've learned to do things that make me happy about what I'm producing. You know, never, never satisfied, right? Just happy, and, and um, I'm always trying to improve. And I thought, well, I could probably share some of what I've learned on YouTube as well. So, why not? Uh, I think what I'll do is uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of talking while I draw and also explaining what I'm doing. So. Time to start, I think. Um, this, oh, you know what, like I said, I, I, I just kind of fast forwarded, not fast forwarded, the line work took me a long time, but I didn't, I didn't record it. Just a couple of words about what I've learned when it comes to doing this phase of the drawing. Uh, first of all, 
to get the proportions and everything correct, to get the measurements correct, there's nothing, nothing but practice is going to get that for you. Uh, you just have to keep trying and trying and trying and practicing and, and whatever techniques you want to use, if you want to use a grid, if you want to measure things with a ruler or a protractor uh, or a compass, I should say, you know, do that. Uh, but always with the goal of whatever method you're using to eventually migrate yourself to being able to do it freehand, maybe just by using your pencil as a measuring tool. You know, you see this a lot where people will go, okay, so if I hold it here and I can tell that the eye is about the width from the tip of my pencil to my thumb there, so you can use that, you know, moving back and forth from a reference photo. But yeah, whatever it takes to get the proportions right, get them right, but then always try and challenge yourself to use less of a crutch the next time. Uh, you know, I, I've watched some videos where they say you should never trace. Um, I don't know, I disagree. I, I, I did some tracing when I was getting very frustrated and I couldn't understand what I was doing wrong and why my proportions weren't matching and then I would just take my drawing and put it on top of the other one and, and kind of line things up and then it's like, oh yeah, I see, I see what I did there. Uh, you know, I missed this curve or, or this angle was wrong or that, you know, even though I thought the spacing was right, it wasn't. And you just, you just sort of learn to, to reproduce what you're looking at, which is obviously much harder than it sounds if you've ever tried. Um, and then when I do the line work, uh, I'll include little, little bits of information, you know, like for example, here, um, there's a little bit of shading that I know that I'm going to want to do and, and, and here as well. Um, she's got like a deep shadow well on her cheek over here that I'm going to want to emphasize. Um, you know, the, the lines in the lips, I just want to remind myself, you know, these, these little creases that, that make lips look realistic. I just want to remind myself where they go. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, also with hair, uh, what I do is, uh, you know, very, very often I'll just do the wisps of hair uh, th these won't last into the final drawing, but I just do them to frame the head and also to give me a sense of the direction of the volume of the hair. Uh, here on this side you can see that I've taken the outline of her, of her head sort of into the hair. It's actually, I think I took it in a little far, to be honest, but there's going to be shading here, so um, it's not going to be terrible, but generally you don't want to draw a line for the outline of the head with the hair, because that's just not how it looks in real life. Uh, the hair just kind of grows out of the side of the head and wraps around and that creates the shape so you don't want to make a hard line there because it just looks dumb uh, when you're done uh, yeah so I think uh, I think I'll just get into the shading now so here's what I've learned about uh, about Bristol first of all because it's a very smooth surface you could get really really smooth uh, tones, really, really smooth gradations in tone, which is what you want when you're, when you're drawing. Uh, if, you, if you look around in the world and you see shadow and you, you, know, you see some very, very hard shadows, like when, when, when the sun is shining on something and it casts a shadow on the ground, the line between shadow and light can be fairly harsh. But very often with faces, that's not what you see. The, there is no line between shadow and light. It's just a sort of a general gradation from dark to light from these dark tones to these mid tones to these to these light tones these light areas so bristol really allows you to to do that uh really really well i found and, and it creates a really really nice result so what i'll do uh, uh let me this is probably going to show in the frame at some point this is a very clever contraption that i made out of paper towel and printer paper <laughs> i put my hand on it while i draw it keeps the oils of my hand off the paper and also uh sometimes depending on the temperature in the room you know my hand might sweat a little and, and the paper towel absorbs that so that it doesn't go through the paper and then warp the, the paper that the drawing is on okay uh, enough talking yeah so I'm gonna start with the shading so this is a 2H pencil and um, I actually did the line work with a 2H pencil I do that on purpose so that when I start shading the lines that I've drawn and the, and the shading that I do blend so you don't really see lines. Um, the thing about this smooth surface is that it's pretty unforgiving as far as if you if you press too hard or if, if the angle of your pencil changes and you get kind of a scratch into the paper 
it's pretty unforgiving. Those blemishes tend to show and you can do a little bit to fix them, but it's better if you, uh, if you minimize those. So what I'm doing right now is I'm actually moving my pencil over the paper in, in the way that I intend to start shading. And you can't see it from the angle of the camera, but I slowly, slowly, slowly move closer to the paper until it just grazes and then I get a feel for the surface and for the stroke and uh, you'll hear it when it happens. So there we go. I've touched the surface. We've made contact. Uh, and I'm just going to start to shade in from the edges. Uh, and I'm really, really pressing extremely lightly. Like it's almost, I'm almost not using any of my own force to, uh, for the graphite to touch the paper. And when I say my own force, what's happening is it's the force of gravity that's doing most of the work here. So it's the mass of the pencil which is what determines how much there is for gravity to pull on, which determines the weight, uh, which is a physics slash math lesson. And, uh, and that is what's creating graphite to transfer from the pencil to the paper. And by doing that, by making the stroke as light as I can, like, you know, really by just letting gravity pull the pencil to the paper, uh, I may, it, it, there's a couple things that I, you accomplish with that. First of all, you're not grinding the graphite into the paper, which is what happens when you press hard. And that, of course, later makes it difficult to erase things. And erasing, when you're doing portraits, is actually a key stage because the eraser becomes not something that you use to fix mistakes, but something that you use to draw. Uh, you know, once you've, once you've laid down some graphite, once you've created some tone, the eraser is essentially a white pencil uh, and it's really cool the way that it works and, and you know later on we'll get to that and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, the other reason that you want to just sort of let gravity do the work here is because if you press hard uh, you make these these deep grinds into the paper and your strokes show and it's very difficult to smooth it out. So. Uh, there's not much for me to talk about as I do this, as far as technique goes. You know, you'll see me work my way around her face, you know, forehead, and illogical, you know, separations, the forehead I do, and then I'll move down into the cheeks, uh, and the nose, and so on. You know, while I'm doing this, I guess I'll tell you some of the things that inspired me to start drawing. I was 45 years old. That's a lie. I was 46 years old when I started drawing. And uh, what I do for my day job is uh, I'm a high school math teacher. And last year, as in last school year, I had a student who was quite a talented artist. She's actually now studying architecture. And one day she was showing me some of the stuff that she'd done and she had done a portrait of Bob Marley. She did it in, in pen, I believe. And it was just so good like it, it, she just got such a great likeness of him and everything about the portrait just screamed talent to me and I just it just stuck in my head it's like how does, how does somebody do that how do you how do you take what you see whether it's from a photo or whether it's from real life and then transfer that to paper through your hands so accurately that somebody looking at what you've done can can fully tell what it is you were trying to do. Uh, something's happening here right now in the drawing. There's a little area of shadow that I want to make sure I, uh, I, I just always remind myself that it's there. So I'm spending a little bit of extra time with the pencil going over this area. It's not going to create something that lasts, but at every stage of the drawing it's going to remind me to keep that area darker than the areas nearby. So that's what's happening. Uh, yeah, so anyway, she, she was just ridiculously talented and that, that really stuck in my head. And I think that's probably what happened uh, during, the, the, during the ensuing summer. You know, I just kept thinking about that and I kept thinking, you know, I want to try it. I'll never be as good as she is and I, I really can't imagine I ever would be, but I want to be able to do that. So that's what got me started. And I actually uh, mentioned that 
to uh, my friend and colleague. She's the art teacher at school. And she's the one to, who told me actually to check out the Alfonso Dunn videos. And uh, I was hooked immediately. And when I say hooked, I mean, I really, really wanted to be able to do the kinds of things that I saw real artists doing. And, uh, and my first attempts were, uh, were quite humorous. Now, in fact, I've posted just about every drawing I've ever done, good or bad, just about, uh, on my Instagram account. So you could always check that out. The Instagram username is Studio Delin. Uh, same as the YouTube username that you're watching. So if you're wondering what the spelling, all you have to do is check it out on the on this YouTube video. And uh, if you're inter if you're interested, you can go and you can check out that Instagram account. But uh, beware, the Instagram account wasn't always an account for art. And to be honest, it still isn't completely just an account for art, but mostly it is. Um, I lifted the pencil up to readjust some things and I don't like to just put it back down again so I'm doing that same exercise where I, I draw in the air for a while and slowly 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 until I graze the paper so yeah that Instagram account used to be just a you know, like a regular Instagram account you know, posting stuff selfies what have you I, uh, I spent a lot of time in the gym and uh, there's a lot of gym selfies there if you scroll down far enough so uh, yeah don't worry Hope you braid. Anyway, if you scroll down, you start. You'll see exactly when I started to draw. And you'll see the first drawing I did. It's this uh, this cartoonish-looking, bearded, muscle dude with his arms stretched out, and his the, <laughs> the anatomy is completely inaccurate in it. Uh, and the drawing is very, very flat, and he looks kind of scary, actually. But uh, but you know, it's a drawing. And then you'll see some some attempts, some attempts that I did. Uh, at getting anatomy correct, uh, at getting eyes correct, drawing from imagination, drawing from a photo reference. And it's cool, I find, because you, you see the progression of someone who doesn't have what you would call natural talent. And, you know, I can talk a little bit about natural talent, if that even is, is even a thing. But definitely there's something. Some people are able to pick things up very quickly and that, that sort of translates to natural talent. I, I'm not like that when it comes to drawing. Uh, if I have natural talent, it's in other areas. In mathematics, for example, you, if, if you were gonna use the phrase natural talent on me, you'd say that's where I have it. Uh, studied math in university and math was always my thing. Now I teach it. Anyway, you want to see the progression of somebody who doesn't have what you call natural talent, but who's just really, really wants to improve and, and really focusing on learning by mistakes and trying to find out, you know, when something goes wrong, what went wrong, so that you can address the issue. Uh, you know, these are, that's what you'll see, I think, if you go through my Instagram account. And then, then it reached a point where uh, some people noticed what I was doing and asked me, to my surprise at first, if, uh, if they could pay me to, to do it, you know, to, to do a portrait of them or to do a portrait of their kids. And I thought, wow, what a, what a responsibility that is. Like, you know, it's an honor for someone to ask you to do that, but this huge responsibility to, you know, they obviously think that you're good at it and they want you to do something for them and they want to pay you and, you know, whatever they're going to get, decent chance they're going to display it in their home and that's your work. And I, I agreed, you know, I'm always, I'm always interested in a challenge. So I, I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do that. But that, of course, was the next level of, uh, of upping my game, as they say because you know, it became not just about trying to improve, but about actually doing something that somebody would be willing to display in their home. And it was very gratifying and remains gratifying. Uh, I really, really like doing those, uh, those custom portraits. And I started to, to uh, 
experiment with things. At first, I was drawing men and, and like bodybuilding type things or, or, or weightlifting type things. And then people told me um, it's very difficult to draw portraits of women. They said portraits of men are easier to draw because men have these sort of craggy lines in their face and these sort of harsh angles. And if they don't have harsh angles, it's considered flattering if, uh, if you sort of make the angles more harsh. So, and that's thought to be easier to do. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, if that's the case, then I want to learn how to draw women because if I could do that, if that's more difficult, then, you know, I'll be able to draw men as well. So, I mean, that was my thinking. So I started drawing women, uh, faces, full bodies. When I draw full bodies, I tend to choose fitness models. To be honest, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of because I'm not yet that good at drawing and capturing proportions. And when you draw fitness models, the proportions tend to be, uh, um, I don't know what the word is, consistent? I was going to say correct, not really correct, there's no such thing as, I mean, correct is just when you get it right. But fitness models just sort of have this same, the sameness to their proportions because of, of the industry and because of the way that they develop their, their bodies in the gym and, and, you know, not just in the gym. Uh, it's diet and exercise. But anyway, that's a, that's a video for another time. And so, yeah, so basically that enabled me to get good at the, uh, the issues that people have when they're drawing females. And that is that the skin tends to be very smooth without a lot of opportunity to show contour because to be honest, it's, it's the cragginess, it's, it's shadows that, uh, that create contour, that create a 3D effect. Okay, I have more to say about that, but I've reached the stage of the drawing uh, where I've laid down my first layer of tone um, using this 2H pencil. And what happens now is it, it really doesn't look very good. It never does at this stage. And I'm not sure if the, uh, the camera can show that as, as much as I do my best to keep a smooth stroke, um, it's not the effect yet that I want. And I, I think I'll have a look here and maybe zoom in just to show you what I'm talking about. Maybe it does show pretty well. But anyway, well, that's zooming out. Try it again. So there, you can see... You can see the strokes, even though I do my best to keep that from happening. Uh, I've, I've just learned that I can't totally keep it from happening. So what I do now is I take just a regular cotton swab. I keep them uh, next to my next to my workstation here, and I'm just going to talk about, believe it or not, about how to hold this cotton swab. The Bristol is super sensitive to oils from your hand, and because of that, uh, the oil that you get on the cotton from your fingers you have to keep that away from the paper as well. So I always make sure I know which side I'm holding the cotton on and I don't let that side touch the paper. I don't, you know, as, as the cotton gets used up, I don't rotate it. I'll just take a new piece. So this phase is uh, pretty interesting actually. You just, you just start to rub. I, I start to rub lightly at first. And I just work my way around all the areas where I applied the graphite. And as I do that, uh, the effect starts to work where you get this extremely smooth tone. And it's that extremely smooth tone that I want to keep throughout the drawing. Uh, as, I, as I move the cotton over areas where I have lines, you know, line work, um, it tends to take away some of that graphite as well. So the lines themselves fade out. And some of those I don't mind when they fade out, and some of those I feel like I won't have a memory of where I put them. And so after I finish this blending phase with the cotton, I'm actually going to go and reinforce some of those lines 
uh, while they're fresh in my memory. I don't know if I really need to do that. I could always, you know, I mean, I have the reference photo and I can always just kind of replace them later, but I, if I don't do it, I, I find I lose my sense of the drawing. You know, I lose my sense of her face if I don't. So once I finish this blending phase, I'll, uh, I'll go through. Now I'm not really pressing very hard. Sometimes I increase the pressure a little bit if there's an area where it just seems like it's not smoothing the way that I want. But for the most part, it's pretty light pressure. Not just gravity, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely my hand, uh, the force of my muscle creating that pressure. But it's very, very light. I'm not, I'm not trying to kill anybody with this. Okay. In this first phase, you're going to reveal some areas that aren't as smooth as other areas, and that's okay. There's going to be a lot of layers, and, uh, and that'll work itself out. Yeah, she's got some necklaces down here that I'm kind of obliterating. That's okay. I'll reinforce them. You'll notice I kept the lips white, even though eventually they'll be darker than most of the uh, rest of her skin. I do that because I just kind of like to save them for later. There's no real reason. I guess it also maintains the shape. Okay. Uh, I'm going to zoom in again so that you can see how this has changed. Uh, going to zoom in. Now you can see the grain of the paper there, but you, the, the strokes of the pencil are no longer so prominent as they were before. Okay, now let me reinforce some of those lines. I'm getting nervous. I don't want to forget where they were. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, I'll take a, an F pencil for that and just reinforce. And, uh, not, not anything too technical here. Just want to use some clean strokes to reinforce those. Let's get the eyebrow back in. This isn't how the eyebrow will eventually work, but the shape, the outline of the eyebrow. Uh, there's her other one. Just reinforce that so I remember where it is. Uh, there's a little cast shadow from the side of her nose over here. Reinforce that underneath her nose, the nostril, the edge of the other nostril over here, uh, her jawline, and her chin. And there's a shadow here, which I'll spend much more effort on a little bit later. Uh, some of the curves in the ear. Ears, ears are hard and they, they, I still struggle with them and they, they did take me a while even to get where I am. Let's reinforce this crease here, the eyelid crease. If you're, if you're gonna do portraits uh, of faces, you definitely want to take the time. There's a highlight here. Eventually I'll work with the eraser to get that. You definitely want to take the time to learn the anatomy of the skull and of the face. Uh, I don't mean to the point where you could become a plastic surgeon or anything, but it, you really, if you don't have an understanding of the shape of the skull and of, of how the pieces of your face sort of become what they are, there are so many things that are going to be a mystery to you. So you take some time, there's just tons and tons of videos on YouTube that explain the anatomy of the skull and how that works and the reason that I bring it up now this necklace is pretty interesting it's uh, it's this rope this sort of braided rope that turns in that has these these sections hanging from it they these spherical sections I don't really know how much detail I'll end up doing when I get to the necklace I tend to 
I tend to cheap out when it comes to that. Yeah, so the skull, um, if you could learn one thing, that, uh, you know, that's, that's a stupid way to start. One, one thing you definitely need to understand about the skull is this region right here. You know, the eye, but really what's going on in the skull is there are these holes in the skull, the eye sockets, and they're quite large. And your eyeball is literally a sphere that sits inside that hole and it's held in place by a lot of complicated muscles, but then there's this skin that comes down over the this is the brow ridge here, it comes down over and then would would just totally fall into the socket if not for the eyeball. And so it, it protects the eyeball. And where the eyeball and the skin like where the skin folds over and then starts to cover the eyeball, there's always this deep crease. I mean, I've never I've never drawn a portrait where there wasn't a deep crease here in the skin. And that's because the, the, the skin overlapped over the ridge and then onto the sphere of the ball and then starts to come out again because of the eyeball. And then there's a lower eyelid which also tends to have a crease but not, not nearly as pronounced. Um, and that crease, the shape of it and the distance uh, of that crease from the eyebrow and from the top of the eye, those are the things, you know, the, these mysteries. I used to find it such a mystery. How do you make something look like somebody? What, what makes somebody look like them? Yeah, I used to wonder. And I, when you start to draw, you start to know what the answers are. First of all, it's shapes, the shape of the eyes, the shape of the nose, its distances. And that distance right there is one of the key distances. Uh, so, you, you know, I always work to get that pretty correct. Okay, this is what I call the foggy stage of the drawing where, and the reason I call it that is because, you know, the face just kind of looks foggy and it looks flat, it doesn't look three-dimensional. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a darker pencil. I was using a 2H, I think I'm going to go with a B. Uh, you can't see it off frame, but I have about 30 pencils of all different hardnesses and I'm looking for my B pencil because naturally the one that I want to use of all the billions of pencils I have, the one that I want to use is the one I can't find. Okay, there it is. Uh, there's my B pencil, and um, I don't love how sharp it is, so you'll hear my electric sharpener running. Uh, if you watch some of these artists that I talked about on YouTube, they, they do this technique where they take their pencil and they sharpen it with a razor, uh, so that the lead itself is very extended and they do that because it helps them generate even tone and, and it also helps them as you create tone on the page you sharpen the pencil so that you can always do detail by tilting the pencil in and it's a really really cool technique um, one that one day I'm gonna look at incorporating but for now I just I just take my Statler pencils and I take my electric uh, sharpener and I do what I can with that okay so I'm gonna start because I'm right-handed, I tend to work my way from the left side of the picture to the right. Uh, because, uh, well, you know, because, because I'm right-handed. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now in this case, I'm looking at my reference photo, and you always wanna know where the light source is coming from. There's, there's you know, the only reason we can see things is because of light. And then the interesting thing is, with the light, the only reason you can see things is, be is often because of the shadow that the light creates. Or the only reason you can see shape, I guess, is because of the shadow that's created by the absence of light. So it's shadows that you want to look for. And in the reference photo that I'm using, um, this is a shadow here under her chin. And because this shadow is fairly symmetrical, you, you can see that the, that the light is coming almost from directly above her, but this side of the shadow, this distance from here to here, is greater than this distance from here to here. And for that reason, I know that the light is coming from directly above, but not directly above. It's a little bit to her right, in other words, to the, to the left of the drawing. And that means there's more shadow on this side of her face than there is on this side, but it's subtle. It's not, it's not a lot more. So, it's kind of a shame, actually, that I'm right-handed in this case, because I usually like to start from the side that has more shadow, but I'm, I'm deciding right now that I'm going to start from the, from the side that has less shadow, just because of the way that my, my coordination works. 
So with this B pencil, I'm going to do the same thing that I was doing with the 2H. I'm going to start lightly shading. Uh, and we're going to start to see almost right away uh, a 3D effect start to happen. Uh, when I say almost right away, I mean, you know, I'm looking at it now and only because I know where I'm going, I already start to see 3D, but I doubt any, I doubt that just a casual observer would, would see it. But, like I said, the light is coming from almost directly above, slightly to her left, so slightly to her right, so slightly to the left of the drawing. So there is some shadow here, which I'm starting to introduce. And now we start to think about the anatomy of the face, the, the cheekbone. Uh, artists that I've watched, they talk about the planes of the face, and planes to a mathematician are just flat surfaces. You know, think piece of paper, a piece of paper is a, fl uh, is a plane. Um, a sphere is not a plane to a mathematician. Uh, but drawing planes are, you know, it's not, they're not quite what we mean when we talk about mathematical planes, but nonetheless, they're, they're just different angles on a three-dimensional object that catch and reflect light in different directions. So her cheeks, her cheekbones, which are here, they are angled somewhat up, and so they reflect light upwards and give that, that area of the photo or the drawing a lighter look. And then there's a contour created by that cheekbone. So you tend to get a lighter, sorry, a darker area underneath the cheekbone, like this. Uh, now that I'm using a darker pencil, the, the stroke that I use is even more important because uh, when the pencil gets away from you, which happens, um, Sometimes you get these lines that are, that are sort of ugly, and you can fix them with the cotton to some extent, but I mean, you know, why create something that you have to fix if you can just be a little more careful from the get-go? So, I'll just continue shading this area here. I'm also keeping in mind as I do this that the other side of her face, which I haven't gotten to yet, uh, is is darker than this side, but not by much. And I'm mentally leaving room, I like with the with the with the the tone that I'm using. I'm mentally leaving room to do something darker on the other side, and that's that's actually not a good habit. Um, a lot of the artists that I watch correctly say that you should establish your darkest tones first. And uh, what can I say? They're right. Uh, I just, because of the fact that I'm right-handed and because I find that no matter what I do, as I work my way across the drawing, the graphite gets smeared. I like to work from the left side of the drawing to the right side of the drawing. Um, I could totally keep the drawing from getting smeared by, by not letting anything touch the drawing while I work. That's, that's, a, that's definitely a valid technique. But I'm so new to this and it's not something that I've practiced a lot of that when I try and do this without something to stabilize my hand you know like right now my hand is being stabilized by this my paper towel contraption when I try to do it by not stabilizing my arm um, I don't get I don't get the results that I want okay the uh, the her chin has some highlights so I'm, I'm gonna leave that part like this part over here, I'm going to leave that, but the underside, as it curves underneath to her, uh, to the underside of her, her chin, you know, the part that we can't see, um, we start to lose some light there. So there's always a gentle, I shouldn't say always, actually I've, I've, I've done portraits where there wasn't any sort of gradation here, but there's always a gentle gradation as you get to the edge of the chin and the jaw. Uh, okay, I'm working my way to the side of the drawing that I don't want to be on yet. Another thing that you uh, that you'll learn as you watch uh, artists is they talk about you know not drawing with your wrist but more drawing with your arm uh, and uh, like here drawing with your wrist versus drawing with your arm. Uh, drawing with your wrist is is okay. 
I find for little details, uh, you're, you're, you'll find that you're comfortable holding a pencil like this because you learn to write like this. And little details, you know, like this pupil here, you know, I'll, 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 you can do that with your wrist. Um, but for, for, for generally for, for bigger things, you want to try and move from your, from your shoulder. And when you learn to do that, which is not something I've really gotten that comfortable with yet, I still practice a lot with it. When you learn to do that, you can, you can be very precise, but at first it feels awkward. So I think if you're, if you're paying attention to what I do with my, with my pencil as far as like how I hold it and how I work with it, you'll see that I'm not yet at a stage where I'm doing things the best way. Uh, and, and there's a reason for that, because right now what I'm doing is I'm working on a, a portrait. I want to finish this portrait. In, in other words, when I'm done, I want to have a portrait that looks good. And which means that, yes, I'm practicing. You're always practicing. Whenever, you, whenever you're doing something, you're practicing that thing. It's just kind of the definition of practice. So yes, I'm practicing, but I'm not doing this to practice. I'm doing it uh, to create something. And when I'm in that mode, when I'm in creation mode, I go with what I'm comfortable with at the moment. So I let my skills evolve with deliberate practice, where I just sort of practice fundamentals. And then as I get better and better with those fundamentals, when I'm doing something like this, which is creating a finished, uh, what I plan to be a finished work, I start to incorporate them. And I get better as I do so, because there's a reason those fundamentals are fundamental. They do make you better, but uh, until you're good at them, they can be frustrating. I'm just gonna, this is what I do. I get to the eyebrows and I, I, I slowly create them. I don't, with eyebrows, I don't, I guess there comes a time where I, I go in and I really draw the eyebrows, but until that time arrives, I just kind of reinforce them as I get close to them. I think I'm going to work on her, her nostril a bit. Uh, nostrils, or noses, I should say, are uh, they're a real challenge. They, uh, I, a challenge I haven't completely, I don't feel like I've mastered to the point where I'm happy yet, but I'm definitely further along than I was. There are so many complicated shapes. Um, but there are some things that are common to everybody. So, you know, everybody's got nostrils. I mean, assuming that they haven't been injured or damaged in some way. Everybody's got these two nostrils. And um, then there's like a bulge that comes along here. Uh, some people it's very pronounced, some people it's not. And that creates some shadows in this area here always. Um, and then, of course, there's the nose itself, which casts a shadow, usually in these creased areas over here, you'll see a cast shadow from those. Um, cast shadow is where something is blocking the light from something else. Uh, you, you know, that's probably obvious to a lot of people who are listening, but in case it isn't, if you have something that blocks, like here, you know, I put this hand here and my hand blocks the light from the drawing, it, 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 my hand casts a shadow. But then... There's other kinds of shadows, which are not cast shadows, just light hitting a surface with less intensity because it's, it's angled away from the light. Like this is, a, this is not cast shadow, whereas this is. So there's cast shadow inside the nostril. And if you, if you think of it as cast shadow, then you start to draw it more correctly. So the, the outside of the nose is casting a shadow on the inside of the nose, where the nostrils are. And that's usually very, very, very dark. I suppose it's always very dark unless there's light shining up their nose, which you know, I've never really done a portrait where the light was shining up somebody's nose, but I suppose that'd be fun to do. And you can get away with making that pretty dark, but careful not to make it dark all the way out because the cast shadow doesn't cover the entire inner nose. So it tends to lighten up as you come out. Uh, but, and it lightens up gradually. There's not usually a very hard line for that. And you know, it's funny because once you do that, once you get that cast shadow of the nostril in, uh, already your nose starts to look 
3D and you start to feel better about, you know, maybe this is actually a human nose. Okay, uh, for her, there's some cast shadow here and underneath the nose. This, this part here is not nose, this is shadow of nose. And then that shadow wraps around into the other nostril a little bit. And then there's some light shading here. I'm not going to do that with this pencil. I don't think I don't want it to. I don't want it to match up with the shading or the cast shadow that I did inside the nostril. Okay, and then and then there's cast shadow here. Okay, uh, now there is some shading here because this creates this this side of the nose has a little bit of a plane angled away from the light. Uh, but it's very, very subtle on women. Very, very subtle. Unless, the, unless they're in harsh light or they have a very pronounced nose, like a very distinct shape. But generally speaking, the shading is very subtle. And if you overdo it, uh, you get very upset with yourself because the nose just starts to, it stops to look right. So let me just get some of that in here. I'm actually underdoing it on purpose because it's better to underdo it and then have to add some tone later than to overdo it and try and repair it. You, you can repair that when you overdo it with, uh, with an eraser, but it's a frustrating process. You, you tend to have to erase a lot of stuff that you liked just to get the way, rid of the stuff you didn't like. And... Uh, and then you're redrawing a lot of things and, and then you know, you're trying to even out the tones and it's just more frustrating than something you want to have to deal with. Okay, I think I want to show you what happens when you bring the cotton back. So I'm going to zoom in again so that you could see what I've done and how it looks. And yeah, it's looking 3D but oh great I've got this tripod set up and if I zoom in further than this you lose the part I wanted to zoom in on and I don't want to start tilting the camera because honestly I spent a lot of time trying to get this right so I think I'll leave it like that and now I'll get the cotton swab again here it is and uh, there's the side that I used last time. It's got graphite on it. There's the side that I was holding. So I'm going to make sure to keep using that side. Okay. And this time what I do is I start with the cotton. I start in the part that has sort of all of the darker value. And I kind of smooth that out first. And then when I like it, I blend it into the lighter area nearby, uh, which, which creates that subtle gradation in tone, that, that subtle changing of the shadow or morphing of the shadow from dark to light. And it's something I used to try to do with the pencil alone, and you can do it. You know, I, I did have some success with that, but then I found this, this works and it creates something more natural or more, I guess, organic. So I do this uh, in a minute or whatever. I'm going to put down this cotton swab and I'm going to grab a Q-tip because the cotton swab is good for large areas, but if you try to get inside some smaller areas, you inevitably smudge up too much. Okay, I'm going to grab the Q-tip. Uh, you know, when I say Q-tip, I'm not kidding. Uh, and uh, let's grab one of those and get in there. And here's the, here's the thing, when you hold the Q-tip, I've, I've learned to hold it from the center uh, and not let this edge here, sorry, this, this tip, this tip that I'm not using, I don't want it to touch my skin. So I, I'm, I'm going to actually do my best to hold it so that it doesn't touch the skin. And the reason is because I want to turn it around and use it later. So I always hold it from the center. 
And this is doing the same thing that the big cotton swab was doing. It's just, it lets you be more precise because of the, uh, the smaller tip. So I'll just blend some of these areas in where I added the darker tones. And when you do this, you, you get graphite onto the, onto the tip of the Q-tip and the Q-tip then actually can draw a little bit. So sometimes you can go and you can darken areas like you don't have to, you don't have to blend outward from a dark area. You actually have graphite on the Q-tip and you can create some other subtle gradations which is a technique I, I really have found I use a lot. Okay, there's, you know, this is, this is that eye socket, the, that hole in the skull, and you have to understand that the skin is dipping into that, and that's, you get these shadows here that come out right away. And uh, I didn't really do this part, but I think I'll use the Q-tip a little bit to get some of the shading in here as it dips under the brow ridge and heads into that crease before it comes back out again to protect the eyeball. Okay, it's, uh, it's definitely looking more 3D now than it was before. Uh, it doesn't really look like anything finished in any sense of the word and there's lots of layers still to go. Um, but now I feel like, yeah, I, I feel like her eyes are looking at me and saying, how come you haven't drawn me yet? So I'm going to, uh, well, you know, I'm going to draw the eyes, but before I do, let me just show you the, uh, you see that? Can I get the light there? The tip of the Q-tip is quite dark here. Here's the tip I didn't use. I don't know if that shows. And there's the tip I did use. And I'm going to actually be able to draw with that tip. Uh, when I say draw, I just mean add graphite to the paper, not just blend it. Okay, so the eyes. Um, I'm going to take, I think, a 3B pencil. Let me find my 3B. There it is. There's a, 3B is one of, the, one of the pencils I buy a lot of because it's a soft lead but not so soft that you can't be precise with it. So I tend to use them a lot because they like, they're sort of dual purpose. You can, you could do very dark stuff with a 3B and you can at the same time do very precise stuff. And I tend to use it as a multi-purpose tool and I go through them really quickly. So I buy them like six at a time. And uh, definitely those, those are the ones that I end up sharpening the most. Okay, so I'm gonna use this 3B pencil to start with the eyes. It's not sharp, so. Can we rectify that situation? Okay, um, I'm going to start, I always start with the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. Uh, you probably knew that. Anyway, here's the deal. The outer edge, which we think of as a circle, um, is always quite dark. Now. The trick is, is that although it, it's, it's a circle when you just sort of draw them, you have to understand that in real life it's kind of a bit of a sphere bulging out of a sphere. Like in other words, the white part of the eye, the eyeball is a sphere, and then the iris is the top part of a sphere that's inside the other one and it's poking out. So it, it bulges a little bit. And that... I find creates a dark edge that and just the musculature of the iris the the iris has muscles that contract and dilate the pupil the pupil is that black circle in the middle and that's actually how the light gets into your eye and that's actually how you see things and the iris is muscle that contracts and dilates the pupil to allow in more or less light depending on how bright your surroundings are and those muscles um, are what give such interesting shapes inside the iris. You know, those sort of swirling 
they look like lines unless until you look closely and then they're just like these cool swirls anyway the edge of the iris is always darker than the rest so when you're drawing in graphite you can get away with making that a dark circle but it's actually not quite a circle you it's it's a little bit of an oval like like a long oval this way and if you do that right you'll just see that it looks more real uh, I'll do this one at the same time all right I'm actually very pre pressing very lightly um, See, it's not in, in this in the in the reference photo that I'm using the bottom of the iris is actually visible that's not always true for portraits but it's true for this one a lot of times it's hidden underneath the lower eyelid okay then the pupil itself which is pretty much just black um, I'm not gonna press hard but I'm not gonna worry about keeping it light because eventually I'll come out, I'll come back to this pupil with a much darker pencil probably a 6b or or even a 7 or an 8b and then there's this highlight here that's the light reflecting off the surface of the iris and you learn when you're doing portraits realistic portraits even even cartoons uh, any really any picture that you want to look realistic you learn to keep that highlighted it just adds that element of truth to what you're doing. Uh, I kind of made one pupil noticeably larger than the other, so let me just make this one a little bit larger, give her eyes more of a dilated look. Yeah, that's better. Okay, now I'm not going to shade the iris itself in yet, because I'm holding this 3B pencil, which is a dark pencil. I'm going to use it for her upper eyelid. So the upper eyelid is skin that comes over the sphere of the eyeball and then there's a part of that skin that is angled completely down which means it doesn't really catch light at all and the way that manifests in a drawing is you can you can color it quite dark so right now I'm, I'm coloring the the skin of the underside of her upper eyelid and that's where the eyebrows sorry the eyelashes eventually protrude from I don't, I don't draw the eyelashes until the end uh, because eyelashes are pretty delicate and I'm constantly blending and smoothing and if I draw the eyelashes too early I end up just blending them out so for a while she'll be lashless for a long while uh, okay so get that just a little bit thicker there um, there's always a shadow cast onto the iris and it took me a while to realize why this is true so the eyelid casts a shadow onto the eyeball like in this area here I'm not going to shade it yet and then there's going to be a shadow cast onto the iris and the shadow is going to be lower on the iris than it is on the rest of the eyeball and it took me a while to realize why that is but of course the reason it is is because the iris is a different sphere than the eyeball it, it, it protrudes more and so the shadow is different the cast shadow of the eyelid onto the iris is different than the cast shadow of the eyelid onto the eyeball so I will do that cast shadow onto the iris uh, so it's kind of here I'll do it lightly I'm gonna make sure not to obscure the highlight okay uh, let me just deepen this a little bit now the lower eyelid faces the light when it's coming from above and so it's usually very 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 light and the shift from eyeball to skin is very subtle so not a good idea to do a hard line here I actually at first I just I do dashes just to give me a sense of where that is and then I'll shade underneath because that's the part that faces away from the light remember there's that sphere of the eyeball pushing out and pushing that skin down a little bit so I'll shade a little bit underneath there okay now I'll introduce some I'll just introduce or deepen this crease again I always keep coming back to this as I work and I deepen it as I'm holding darker pencils softer pencils and I'll use it I'll use the 3b right now to introduce a little bit of shadow here just a little bit and a little bit above because remember it, the, the skin wraps around the brow ridge into that crease so this part is facing down and this part here isn't facing down it's facing sideways 
but they're both they both get shadow. Okay, and uh, yeah, let's see. I don't like how this looks. Let me just take this crease. She's got a crease that kind of ends here, and then there's another smaller crease that comes down. Okay. Since I'm holding the 3D, let me darken the nostrils. That's another thing I do. The nostrils end up being, the cast shadow part inside the nostril ends up being one of the darkest parts of the drawing. So as I introduce darker tones into the drawing, I go back to places that should be darker and darken them. Okay. Let me do her eyelid here on this side. And really I do this I don't have a technical reason for doing the eye at this stage of the drawing. I do it because, i got to be honest with you, it's like she was asking me to. It's like she's saying, my eyes don't look good, and, and I guess it makes me lose faith in the drawing if it doesn't at least a little bit look like the subject throughout. So there's a lot of, a lot of her, her eyelid is facing down here, plus there's a lot of cast shadow onto the eyeballs. It's actually hard to tell sometimes which part is skin facing downward and which part is cast shadow onto the eyeball. Okay, there's the shadow onto the iris. There. Let me just thicken that a little bit. There's the edge of the eyeball there. The tear duct. There's the tear duct and there's the eyeball. So, tear duct, eyeball. Uh, tear ducts tend to have this like shiny part in them, which to be honest, I am not so good at getting. I, I try. Sometimes I have a little bit of success, but I don't, I don't love how I get the tear ducts. We'll see that later. Okay, let me give some of the shading here for the underside of the lower eyelid. We'll draw some eyelashes in later. It will add, it'll add realism to this. Let me deepen this crease. Kind of ends here. There's some shadow here. The skin here is facing down. Deep crease. Skin is facing down. She's got a secondary crease here too. So I'll just do that. That may not last. We'll see. Sometimes you you know you do your shading and you do these little fine creases and they get obliterated by the shading. But you could always put them back in. A little bit of shading there. Since I'm holding that 3B. Okay, so I didn't realize it, but the uh, my f first installment of my first part of this video uh, stopped while well, the memory card on the camera filled up about 20 minutes before I finished where I wanted to finish. So I actually did a lot of talking and drawing, uh, not realizing that it wasn't recording, because, uh, yeah, I'm new at this whole recording myself thing. Anyway, just some things that happened where I thought it was recording and it wasn't. Uh, I finished up the shading over here. I took a Q-tip and I, I smoothed out uh, all the shading that I had done here. I also spent some time doing a first layer on the lips. Uh, and I just wanted to, to talk about what happened here, or what happens here, with lips. Uh, you have to understand, if you're gonna draw lips realistically, how they're made up. So the, the upper lip, is actually made up of three different muscles. There's two muscles that sort of match each other on the side here, and then there's a central one here. Uh, if you look in the mirror and purse your lips, you'll, you'll see it. And then the lower lip is made up of two muscles, which is why very many people have a deep crease right in the center here of the lower lip. Uh, the other thing is the lower lip and the upper lip don't generally meet right at the corner. Sometimes they do, but it's, it's actually not that common, uh, I find. Usually, usually they meet a little bit further in. So usually this corner, these corners of the mouth, are formed entirely by the upper lip, 
which points very much downward. So when there's light coming from above, you get a very dark, dark sort of shading uh, over in this region. So I'm, I'm talking and I'm, I'm trying to do a little bit of adjusting of the drawing while I talk, but I'm not wearing my drawing glasses. Um, I, my, my eyes don't work very well up close when I'm not wearing glasses. So I'm just trying to find where I put them. Okay, I found them. Let me put those on. And while I'm at it, let me uh, switch pencils. I was pointing with a B pencil, but I want to use the 3B to continue what I was doing there. Right, so the, uh, the corners here are formed by the upper lip pointing downward, and so they both tend to be fairly dark. Not necessarily the same tone, but often they are. Uh, and then there's a darker tone here as the lip, the, the upper lip points downward, which lightens as you move up. And then often, especially if the, if the woman is wearing lipstick, often there's a darker, a darker part at the top. And then the lower lip you, uh, very often gets a cast shadow from the upper lip right near the center here, especially uh, in women, I find. And then it lightens up very quickly to the point where at first I don't even put any graphite down whatsoever and then there's a darker part as it starts to the lower lip starts to point downwards again and then underneath the lower lip the the lip itself pushes this pushes out which causes skin underneath the lower lip to face down so there's always a, very, uh, a darker area here which helps define the lower lip uh, and it keeps pushing down but then the chin pushes out which makes the skin turn back up again so there's a little crevice here which always uh, has like a little bit of a shadow well uh, and then there's here the divot between the uh, the nose and the mouth it's like two hills with a valley and if you understand where the light is coming from in your photo you'll fill that in correctly uh, also where the where the upper lip meets the skin very often that little part is turned up very very drastically for just briefly so you'll always catch highlights right at the very top of the upper lip where the skin is facing the light and then very quickly it, it dips in again and, and you get a more even tone. Uh, the other thing I did after the, after the <laughs> video card filled up was I just added uh, some of the shadow underneath the, the cast shadow of her chin and her jaw onto her neck and really the only reason I did that was because uh, at this stage I mean the only reason I did that was because it just didn't look the photo, or the drawing, I should say, didn't look uh, didn't look 3D enough for me to want to put it up there on the interwebs. So I just it was more my ego than anything that said, you know what? Let me just add a little bit of the uh, the darker shadow here, just so that you know her head doesn't seem to be sitting flush, or her chin doesn't seem to be sitting flush with her neck. Okay, so this is it for now. This is stage one of the. Uh, the drawing video of this particular drawing of Alexander Dowling um, and I'll continue working on it of course and, and filming but that'll be stage two so this is going to go up on YouTube as it is and really if you've watched until now th this video is over an hour long and I really want to thank you for watching I really 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 appreciate it if you like it uh, please give it a like if you if you like it you know share it if you don't mind and by all means leave a comment tell me what you think ask questions uh, you know, feedback on, on different ways you might like to see a video like this work. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And we'll see you soon.